Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good, y'all did good today. Good to see you. So glad to have you all here. Want to welcome everyone who is joining us in with us here at Old Bethel United Methodist Church. As you can hear us and see us on the TV and the radio, it is our prayer. It is our vigilant hope that God will speak to each of your hearts, that he will minister to you, that you'll find a place and a home in which you can celebrate Christ. We can think of no better place than here at Old Bethel, but we'd be proud for anyone to find Christ in any church that they can go. So glad to have each and every person joining us today. It is a joy, it is a blessing. We hope you receive a blessing in this time. Thank you. If you would, get your Methodist candle and turn the number 340. We'll sing the first, second, and third verses. If you would, please stand. our affirmation of faith it's on page 885 or it's printed in your bulletin where the spirit of the Lord is there is the one true church apostolic and universal whose holy faith let us now declare we believe in God the Father Almighty infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated and turn to number 593. We'll sing all verses.
come or receive this morning's offerings. seated and we'll sing number 378 which I think all of you know we'll sing the first second third and fourth
If you have your Bibles with you and would like to join with me in reading this morning, this morning we'll be reading Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his words. As a pastor, I've had the privilege of making many friends throughout all of these years. Sometimes in my ministerial capacity, I've had the joy of of making friends with with other ministers. Ministers who are part part of my denomination, as well as ministers who are serving other churches and other denominations. Sometimes my ministerial friends and I get together, and we like to have a a little fun. A little bit of fun often at, at one another's expense. All in good sport, of course, but a little fun nonetheless. Not long ago, one of my friends said something like, so-and-so led so-and-so to Christ. Jim led Bob to Christ. To which I replied, no, he didn't. Yes, he did, he said. Bob was baptized. Jim led him to God, which I responded again by saying, No, he didn't. Yes, he did, as his voice became a little more determined in its tone. Well, no, he didn't. I said, I'm sorry, and you're just going to have to learn how to deal with it. Finally, he said, are you saying that Bob isn't a Christian? No, I said, of course not. I am completely certain Bob is a Christian. Well, what exactly are you saying then, he asked. All I'm saying is, Jim didn't make that happen. God did. God was there. God was always there for Bob. Jim helped Bob to hear the voice of and respond to the Spirit of God. But you can't lead somebody to something that's always been there. To someone who is always out there in spirit looking for a moment in which he can touch his child's heart or his child hear his voice. When his child will respond to the prompting of God's profound spiritual touch, you can't lead someone to the, to the touch of God, a touch that, that is ceaseless, a touch that begins at a child's birth, a touch that is felt at one's baptism, a touch that brings us to, to a life, an eternal life with God, a touch that brings us to eternal life where one day God will actually maybe just physically touch us. Jim did not lead Bob. He just told Bob who it was that was touching his heart and soul. So there, boom, I said. Oh, you knew what I meant, he said. Yes, sir, I said, I knew exactly what you meant. I'm just going to see if I can get you stirred up a little bit. Steve Kennedy, he said, you know when you get your whole name, you're in trouble, right? Steve Kennedy said with a smile on his face, You ain't nothing but a troublemaker. To which I replied, I beg your pardon. 
you love me, you know you love me, and besides that, the Lord says you have to love me, so there. To which he replied, yeah, but sometimes you make it harder than it should be. I enjoy my moments with my ministerial friends. Isn't it good to know? Isn't it good to know that we specialize, we serve a God who specializes in search and recovery? Jesus was teaching one day by example and by, by words, but, but mostly by example at first. On this day in the scriptures, he's, he's chosen to give the people around him an, an object lesson, if you will, in order to, to teach them some things they need to know, or in order to teach them of, about God and God's way and God's heart. Jesus was letting the less than desirables, if you will, come near him, tax collectors and various other sinners of sorts. Not only had he been letting them come close to him, it's almost as though he had gone out of his way to associate with them. He, he went to where they were. He even ate with some of them. And that is not what you're really supposed to do, taking time out of his work for the unclean, defiled sword. He was, he was developing a, a stellar reputation, a reputation as being quite a teacher, why some even referred to Jesus as a rabbi. These kinds of activities were not becoming of a man like him. Didn't seem to matter, though. He just kept on associating with them. Well, Jesus didn't seem to have a problem with it at all, but, but the Pharisees and, and the scribes, well, they did. You know, you know, those folks who are supposed to know all about what is proper and what God wants and where God is and all of the, what God is doing. Those people, they, they seem to have a problem with it. They were complaining about his activities. It was all very unbecoming of him having those types of associations. So Jesus, sensing and I suppose hearing the complaints, teaches them again. But not with an object lesson this time. Not a here it is, you can see it kind of lesson. Instead he begins to teach them with words. With the words of parables. Parables that they could relate to. I'll, I'll do it in a bit of a paraphrase form if you don't mind. So you folks got a problem with this, do you? Well, let me just show you how God works. Let me reveal to you the heart of God, a heart you have yet to fully understand or comprehend. You see, in, in many ways you treat your animals better than you actually treat one another. Which one of you would not go out to find the, the one lost sheep? Which one of you would not search through the wilderness, leaving the other 99 behind? Which one of you would not go looking for that sheep, that sorry old rascal that just does not want to participate with the rest of the flock? Which one of you would not go looking for him? Of course you would go, wouldn't you? For that one sheep, that one sheep is important to you. Not only for its value, he's your sheep. He belongs to you, and you want to keep him as your own. Yes, you would, you would go, wouldn't you? And not only would you, you go, but when you found him, when you caught up with him, when you laid you, his hands on him, when you put him up on your shoulders, you would rejoice. You would rejoice to have recovered what had always been yours. That is the way the Father works. He too rejoices. Imagine that. It's good, isn't it? It's good, isn't it, that God is in the search and rescue business? That God is always looking for us. He looks for, for a moment, a place in time when, he, when we will realize that he's looking for us. Better yet, when he, he finds us. Now, she was a very good friend of mine. To this day, a very cherished friend of mine and Angie's. We grew up together. We had worshipped together. We were just good friends. In fact, we had spent a lot of time together, both in, in ministry, ministering to others together. She was a woman of virtue. 
who had a real sense of God's love for her and his love for all others. One day she called me and told me to, to pray for someone she just met. She told me all about this woman she had recently met. We'll, we'll call her Susan. A very kind and, and very sincere person was Susan. Susan had two beautiful children she wanted to raise in a, in a more godly home. But, she said, I've let my relationship with God erode. It's almost as though there's nothing left. left. Various things in her life had caused her to take her eyes off of Christ. My friend called me and asked me to pray that God would be able to touch Susan again. That Susan would, would let God into her life again. Susan, she said, needs to let the Lord minister to her again. My friend had the, the wisdom to know she couldn't push. She could only encourage her. She could only reintroduce her to, the, to God. To a God who longed for Susan. To a God who was looking for her. Jesus told them another parable about a woman who had lost a coin. Now, she could have given up on it. After all, it's just one of those that had fallen through the cracks, so to speak. But she didn't give up on it. It was covered in the dust that lay on the floor. Sweeping away the dirt to see the coin would, would be a lot of trouble, but sometimes you got to deal with the dirt, so the dirt made no difference to the woman. Yes, the coin was only one-tenth of all that she had, just 90%, but... 90% wasn't what she wanted. She wanted 100% of what was hers. So she went to work. She sifted through the dirt. She lit the lamp and she dealt with the dirt that covered the coin until she, she swept enough of it away she could see that coin again. It was a valuable and important piece to her. In the light, she was able to sift through the dirt until all was covered uncovered and recovered and she rejoiced my friend listened to Susan and Susan spoke she talked about her life her old life and, and a new life and she talked about the dirt she listened to Susan and she reminded her that God never gives up on us we may give up on him but he will never give up on us he goes to where we are. And he wipes away the things that make us dirty until we're found and made clean again if we want it. It wasn't long after that, Susan became a member of one of my churches. It was my joy made all the more complete the day I baptized her children. God made that happen. My friend in our church had the privilege of being a part of those moments. Yes, he is. He is the God of search and rescue, isn't he? Indeed, he has been for quite some time. Jesus wanted people to see that. He wanted them to understand it. There were those who saw sinners that day. But Christ saw sheep worth saving and a coin worth finding. Christ taught them that God was, was looking for you. God is willing to shed light in the darkness to wipe away the dirt just, just so he can find you. Just to make you his again. And when he does, well, he and the angels, indeed all of us, celebrate. No one can lead us to God. He's already come to you. He's already there. He's already here right now. He has been with you from the very beginning. You have heard his voice. Maybe you are hearing his voice again. Maybe you're hearing his voice for the first time. But God is always looking for ways into the lives of his children. He will go into the wilderness for you or for any others. He will shine his light into the darkness of any place he can. 
just to find us. He will sweep away the dirt in all of our lives. But we do have to do our part. We have to let him in. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. It's true, isn't it? God is always there for us. We just have to open the door to be found. Our closing hymn. I want to offer an invitation to anyone who would like to come to the altar for prayer time for any need that you have for profession of faith, for just a moment to draw closer to God. The altar is open to all of you. If you'll turn to page 389, we'll sing freely, freely all of the verses. <laughs>